give you a greater understanding of marriage, the principle of marriage and how it affects the culture that we live in. How it affects the culture we live in. If you want to see a better country, then the thing we have to fix above any and everything else is marriage. Good morning. We want to welcome you to our Sunday morning broadcast. Pastors David and Donna Spearman welcome you. Welcome to Kingdom First, located here in Fort Wayne. As we say, God loves Fort Wayne. But now, let's get into this power-packed message. Good morning, Kingdom First. Let's get ready to praise the Lord. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Okay. 
Well, we've been uh, having some good discussion on marriage and family. First, let me say to those watching my streaming live, God bless you. Thanks for being with us today. We're encouraged that you're here. And we pray that God will encourage you and bless you in this message today. So get ready. Let's go. Let's have a word of prayer as we then be start our message. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just give you glory and honor. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace. Lord, we thank you that you are God over everything, that there's nothing that is not under your purview. There's nothing that escapes your notice. There's nothing that can slide by you. You see and know everything. You know all about us. You know our, our failings. You know our successes. You know our potential. You know what our destiny is going to be. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, help us to begin to understand that our hope not, does not lie in a job. Our hope does not lie in us. Our hope does not lie in the government. Our hope does not lie in anybody or anything except you. Our hope is in you. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, guide us and lead us today. Speak to us about marriage, about family. Help us to have a greater understanding of what it means to be married, husband and wife, what it means, what it reflects, and, and how it brings glory and honor to you. In Jesus' most precious name, we thank and praise you. Amen and amen. So as we continue in our marriage and family series, uh, this is our second week. Last week we talked about marriage as we learned that marriage is not a contract, but it's a covenant. There's a difference. A covenant is a lifetime pledge between a man and a woman to love each other sacrificially and to be faithful to each other. Instituted by God from the very beginning, before culture, before society, before any civilization ever rose up, before all of men's plans and pursuits, God instituted marriage. In fact, let me say it like this, marriage is the foundation of everything that we know as a people. Our subject matter today is going to be marriage and society. Marriage and society. Why? Because all civilizations are built on marriage. Every civilization that exists is built on the concept and idea of marriage. In fact, marriage, makes, marriage is the only thing that makes civilization possible. A man for every woman and a woman for every man. In the Bible, it says in Matthew 19, verses 3 through 8, this is Jesus speaking. Well, this, is, this, is, this came to Jesus, and he, he responded. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Is it lawful for a man? Now, notice what they ask him. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Now, remember, this is the Pharisees who came to ask him that. They knew the law. They understood what the law said about divorce. But they're always trying to trick Jesus. They're always trying to, you know, trip him up. So is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read? Now he knew they read it, but he's, because, he, he's throwing it back at them. Have you not read that he, talking about God, who made them at the beginning, made them male and female? So ha ha haven't, didn't you, haven't you read that? And he said, and, and said, for this reason, now he goes on to quote Genesis, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now that's straight, he, he, he quotes it exactly. So then he goes on to say, so then they are no longer two but one flesh. So he emphasizes that point again. Then he goes on to say now, and then he asks this, Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate, or as we understand it from the King James, put asunder. Therefore, what God has joined together, what God has joined together, let no man separate or put asunder. They said to him, so they follow up, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? 
And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts. Because you weren't going to act right and you weren't going to do right. You weren't going to live right and you weren't going to treat your wife right. He said, because of the hardness of your heart permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. In other words, that was not the plan. That was not the plan. So we need to get back to what was God's plan? What did God, what did God want to happen when it came down to marriage? Because there's a marriage principle that we've got to understand. And that marriage principle is the key not only to your success as an individual, but your success as a family and the success of any culture or society or civilization. It is the key. And without it, everything falls apart. All right? Now, you've got governments, and because we're talking about marriage and society, I'm going to kind of stick with that today. But governments can, will change the legal definition of marriage. They'll, they'll try and change it. But you know something, for the longest time in, in this country, for the longest time, for the longest time, I, I'm not exactly sure how long, the, the, the United States of America had, did not have any laws concerning marriage. Because it was a God-given thing and not a state-given thing. Then some bureaucrat got the bright idea Oh, we should, be able, we, should, we should have marriage license and we can charge a fee. <laughs> right? I, I don't know how much they cost, a marriage license costs now. Anybody know? I, I have no idea. But uh, uh, a marriage license, because we can charge a fee. We can, we can, we can oversee it ourselves. And, 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 we, and, and we can make money off this thing. So that's what they began to do. They began to define marriage. Now, in the beginning, they defined marriage pretty decently. Today, in 2024, the definition of marriage in this country has, got, has gotten way out of whack. And so what they began to do over the course of years as they redefined and redefined marriage, they were began to mislead people concerning the true nature of marriage, what marriage is really all about. Every government, no matter where, ought to align their laws with God's word, especially when it comes down to marriage. Now, one of the purposes of marriage is companionship. And there's a lot of other purposes, and I won't get into all of them today, but I'm going to talk just briefly about just companionship. God said that it wasn't good. When he made Adam, he said it was not good for man to be alone. God never made man or you or me or anybody else to be loners. He made us and designed us so that we would have a, com uh, could have a, and would have a companion. Man and woman, he made them, as Jesus said, male and female. The Bible says over in Genesis, he made them male and female. He made it so that there would be companionship. You would not be alone. You'd have somebody that you could connect with, somebody you could talk to, communicate with, somebody you could share your dreams and aspirations and goals with, somebody who would support you and be there with you. Remember, the Bible says that Eve was Adam's helpmate. His helpmate to help him and, uh, and conversely also he would help her right so marriage is for us to live in close relationships which provide a picture of our relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so marriage is nothing but an outward sign visibly of our relationship inwardly with Jesus Christ to live in close relationship with him. How close is your marriage relationship and how close is your relationship with Jesus Christ? This is what the Bible says in Je Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14. This is God speaking. He said, return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. Now, what is he saying there? He's saying, listen, I have a close relationship with you. We are companions together. I am married to you. Return, come back to me. Return to me. He says, I will take you. You come back and return. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. I will bring you to where I am. In other words, he was telling them, look, return to me. Come back to me. 
and he uses the term married. I am married to you. We look at married couples, we look at a husband and wife, and we see them as being in cl as close companions. We see them uh, as, as walking together throughout this life, walking together toward a common goal. Now, and, and those goals and, and aspirations change over the years. Nothing wrong with that, but they're walking together to complete those, each and every single one that they come up with or that God places in front of them. Companionship being together. I'm not going to talk about how a man treats his wife today and how a woman treats her husband today. We'll get that, I think, either next week or week after. I've got that already set up from Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll talk about how that should work. But understand that uh, in marriage, there's that idea of companionship, completion. Now, understand, you're not made complete by marriage. You're made complete only in God. So I want you to understand that. But there is a, a matter of, of closeness, a matter of, in fact, Jesus calls it and God calls it, uh, you become one flesh. All right? Again, marriage is between one man and one woman for life. Now, I know the law says all kind of different things, and men can marry men and women can marry men, women and so forth and so on, but that's not biblical marriage. That might be state marriage, but that's not biblical marriage. And let me help you understand this. There is a difference between biblical marriage and state marriage. The state marriage is not a covenant, it's a contract. Biblical marriage is a covenant. Under the auspices of the state, you can be married for a particular amount of time and you get tired of each other, you can go ahead and divorce and go on your separate ways and nobody cares. In biblical marriage, there is the coming together of a man and a woman to become one flesh. And it is a spiritual union, and it's also a physical union that God has designed so that then we can understand more closely our relationship with Jesus Christ. When monogamy, that's what I'm talk we're talking about here, monogamy, one man, one woman for life, when monogamy is lived out, human civilization begins to flourish. Those who form traditional families succeed. Those who don't normally fail. I'll say that again. Those who form traditional families succeed. Those who don't normally fail. One of the things you'll find is those who are poor are going to have many times the worst success because they're in poverty. And many times it's based on the fact that they did not operate in a proper marriage. One of the things you'll find out of those who are well-to-do, we call them the one percenters or whatever the case may be, the well-to-do, if you look at their lives, you look at everything they're doing, they're following the biblical principle. Because when, well, I'll, 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 I'll say it in a second. Today, when we look at what's going on concerning marriage, we find out monogamy is under, under a, a, a siege and it has become very fragile in the culture and society we live in. There is pressure that when this man or this woman is not meeting your expectations, the pressure is to leave them and find somebody else. We find there is pressure to find your soulmate. And as I think I told you last week, there's no such thing as a soulmate. That's not the, that's not the point of marriage, is to find your soulmate. Uh, uh, it, there, there isn't. The point of marriage is that a male and female are able to come together and, and be companions for life, practice monogamy, bear children, and through that continue the society of the civilization they're living in, but also raising children that are going to be successful. When a society lacks, becomes lax and becomes indifferent about upholding its norms, i.e. marriage, the advantage and benefit of marriage will begin to unravel in that society. I'll say that again. When a society becomes lax and indifferent, and, and, and over the years we have seen this, uh, our culture become very lax and indifferent about upholding moral principles. 
And, and let me tell you something, and here again, I use the word principle. These are moral principles. And anytime we talk about a principle, we're talking about something that just not affects that thing, but it affects so many, it radiates, it affects so many other things around it. And so when a principle is laid out, when God lays out a principle, it's just not, oh, this. Well, when I divorce my wife or uh, a wife says I'm divorcing my husband, you're just not affecting you. You're now affecting the children that you had. You're affecting the people around you. Now listen, I'm not saying that there are, time, I, I, there are times when you better get away from that guy. I'm telling you, there's times when you need to get away from that guy. If he's hurting you and beating you and so forth, ladies, come on. God is not calling you to be somebody's punching bag. God is not calling you to be kicked and hit and, 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 and belittled and torn down. He's not calling you to suffer abuse. That's not a biblical marriage. Too often, too many women especially, have stayed in a situation where, where you know, this guy has been punching him and punching him and, oh, oh well, he always apologizes. Yeah, but he's going to, one day he's going to kill you. And we've seen it play out like that over and over and over and over again. So that's not companionship. I, it's not a man just, 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 to have a, just to have a man. I always tell people, ask God who it should be. Ask God. Amen? But when a society no longer upholds the moral principles that God has laid out, then uh, the benefit of marriage begins to unravel, and we begin to see exactly what we see in our society today, that, that all kind of folks are saying, well, you know, oh, well, you know, we can do this, we can do that, we can do the other, we can do, th and, they, and, and they take marriage, what God has designed, and they make it something way different than what God has laid out. You know, throughout the 1940s, the 1950s, and the 1960s, the percentage of births to unwed mothers, as, they, it, as the term was used back in those days, was in the single digits, four, five, six percent of the total population. Today we're in high double digits. I think I told you last week, overall in this country, 40 percent of children are born to a single parent. In the Hispanic community, 50 percent of children are born to a single parent. In the African American community, 70 percent of children are born to a single parent. You want to hear something really frightening? I believe it's in Atlanta, Georgia, and I believe also New York City. African American women abort more children than are born. Something's wrong. And I'm going to tell you something. All those crazy things that are happening come from the fact that our culture, our, our government, has decided to redefine marriage. See, when you don't uphold the principle of marriage, then other things begin to, and we say, well, what does abortion have to do with marriage? It has a ton to do with it. Simply because, see, when, you, when, you, when marriage is not upheld, when you don't view marriage as, as, the, as the godly principle that it is, then what begins to happen is people begin to have sex and sex becomes meaningless. It becomes something that's just, and then pornography. See, all these things come from the unraveling of marriage. Pornography, abortion, uh, um, what is it, not adultery, what's the, what's the other word? Fornication, thank you. All those come from the fact that marriage, God-given marriage, is not being upheld. Listen, I'm not trying to down anybody. Each and every single one of us has, have a story to tell. I'm not trying to down anybody. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad or anything of that nature. I'm just helping you understand that when a culture, because see, many of us get trapped in that culture. We're trapped. 
See, many, what happens with many of us is we're going along and we're, 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 you know, we're thinking we're doing the right thing, and then the culture comes along and says something. You hear from this, you know, from the north, south, east, and west. You hear so many voices, so many voices, you know, and everybody's telling you, oh, oh, this, that, the other, yeah, yeah you know, yeah, yes, he ain't romantic. He's not this. He's not that. He's not that. And 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 you know, pretty soon you're chasing a dream. You're chasing. Listen, I'm serious. You're chasing something. That is not reality. And instead of taking what you have and, and take, moving forward together, you're dreaming about something else. You're fantasizing about something else. That's what, that's what our culture is doing to people each and every day. And so the next thing you know, before you know it, you, know, you become dissatisfied. You're, you're, ah, he's not this, she's not that. How many men have traded their wives in on a younger model? Like they traded in a car. They trade in a wife. Because our culture has said that's what you do. That's what you do. And so you find these old men with 20, 30 some odd years, girls young enough to be their granddaughters. Sometimes you find older women with some young guy trying to get her groove on. <laughs> Stella. <laughs> I'm talking about Stella got her groove back. <laughs> Not Stella, Stella. <laughs> but hey, you know, why? Because, you know, that's what our culture tells us. That's, you know, once, once, you, once you destroy or try to destroy the principle of a godly marriage, then literally what? Anything goes. Anything goes. And before you know it, all kind of crazy stuff is happening. And look at the culture today. All kind of crazy stuff. Listen, an indicator of whether someone will experience poverty or prosperity is whether he or she knew the love and security of having a married mother and father. That's a fact. I'm not just pulling something out of the air. That's a fact. If, you go, if your child is going to experience poverty or prosperity, it all depends on what kind of family they came from. That is true. Marriage reduces the probability, listen to this, now this is, a, this, is a, this is a statistic. Marriage reduces the probability of child poverty by 80%. 80%. See, that's, that's part of the marriage principle. The marriage principle, so, so when, 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 you, when you redefine marriage and, and, and you try to destroy God, godly marriage, then all, it also brings along poverty. And so now children are being raised in poverty. And there's a great chance that they will not succeed in life. Not just because they were raised in poverty, but throughout life. That, that there's a chance that they won't actually make it in life, that they'll continue in that cycle of poverty. How many times have we seen generations of families in a cycle of poverty? If, some, if a woman says, I want my children to have the best, and I want my children to, to be, then number one, she's, she's, got, she's, got to, she's got to pour the best into them. And it really helps if she's married. I'm not saying get married for marriage's sake. I'm just simply telling you that this is what mar the principle of marriage, this is what it brings. It reduces the uh, uh, probability of child poverty by 80%. That is, that's, that's, wow. That's mind-blowing. And when you reduce child poverty by 80%, that makes it good for the child. Makes it good for society, yes. That means the government has to spend less money on welfare and things like that. 
That means more people are going to be in the workforce because now that this kid has a work ethic because chances are with a, with a mother and father, they give them chores to do. They, they, you teach your child a work ethic very early. You got to work around the house. You got to clean up. You got to wash clothes. You got to do this. All, all that contributes to a work ethic. How does that happen? That happens because there is a mother and father in the house. I'm not saying a mother by herself cannot put a work ethic in a child, but it's harder. It's more difficult. It's more difficult. You know, they, 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 the, the idea is, you know, they say, well, you know, she can, she can, be, she can be both mother and father. No, re she really can't. She can be mom. But she can't be dad. And there are situations where a spouse dies and all those kind of things, and, and, and we understand all those things. But, it, but when, I'm specifically talking about when there is children born and there is not a marriage involved then these statistics really ring true. Children without fathers, let me say, tell you this, are more at risk for drug and alcohol abuse, physical and sexual abuse, to drop out of school, depression, delinquency, getting into criminal behavior, engaging in early, uh, ac uh, early sexual activity, and also being single parents themselves and continue that cycle, continuing that cycle on into future generations. I was talking to a, a man on Wednesday who's, who deals with the homeless and helps the homeless and so forth and takes food there and he, he does you know, all kind of things based on that. And he was telling me, he, he worked at Fort Wayne Community Schools for 20 some odd years and um, he, he was telling me how that uh, he's seen these cycles of homelessness, seen the cycles of poverty, and it's over and over again. It's been in homes where, you know, they, they, they're not even clean. They, there's not even the idea of making sure the house is clean and making sure the dishes are done and, and clothes are washed and so forth and so on. And, and in fact, I can tell you this, uh, the school across the street from us, they've just installed, a, what was it, a, a washer and dryer so the kids can you know, uh, if a teacher sees that a kid needs to close, they can, they can wash their clothes for them. I mean, these are things that should be happening at home. And now the school and, and, and government entities are trying to take up that banner, but they're ill-equipped to do it because they're not mother and father. So there's a value to mom and dad. There's a value there. And when we don't have that, when, 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 when we destroy that principle, when we destroy the uh, marriage principle, then the value of mom and dad begins to diminish. And it diminishes to a point where ultimately, you see some cases, children are raising themselves. Now, now let, let me say this. No matter how you were born, or what your life was like when you were growing up, whether you had both parents or had just one parent, even if you experienced some of the things I've talked about just a few minutes, just a, a few moments ago, because you are now in Christ, your future has changed. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we understand what it says, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Tell them, old things have passed away. And all things are now new. I don't have to allow my past life to, de to, to determine my present and my future. Now, without Christ, that's what's going to happen. But in Jesus, that doesn't have to happen. There is hope. There is a way out of all this stuff. Even though the world and society and the governments have redefined marriage and have tried to destroy marriage as best as they can, there is still a hope. There is still a future for you, and that future and that hope is in Christ Jesus, plain and simple. No matter what, where you came from, no matter what it was like, 
Maybe you were abused. Guess what? You don't have to carry the weight of that abuse in your life any longer because God has washed it away by the blood of Jesus. Glory. Come on, somebody shout glory to God. Maybe you were raised in poverty. Well, guess what? You don't, have to, you don't have to carry the weight of that childhood poverty in your life any longer because the blood of Jesus has washed it away. Let me tell you, you are a new creature in Christ. No longer do I look to the past of where I came from as in my flesh. I look to the past of where I came from in Christ Jesus. He has made me new. I've got a daddy, and his name is God. Glory to God. Come on, somebody. Your past doesn't have to dictate your future unless you allow it to, unless you want to continue to carry that weight. But Jesus came to take the weight off of your shoulders. He came to uh, relieve you of that stress. He came to relieve you of those, that mental anguish. He came to relieve you of all those things. You can sit back there if you want to, but because you are now in Christ Jesus, you can be set free. We're talking about here others who have not realized the power, the saving grace of Jesus and what they're going to face in future generations. But you don't have to face that, praise God. God has given you a new future. He's given you a new destiny. One that's not dependent on your fleshly past but a future that is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. A future that says no matter where you came from, he'll take you from the guttermost to the uttermost. He'll take you from rags to riches. He'll take you from being a nobody to where you're not. He'll take, make you a Joseph if he has to. He'll make you a Jacob. He'll make you a David. If you notice in the Bible, everybody that aligns himself with God always finds success despite their background, despite where they came from. Rahab, a prostitute in Jericho. And yet, when you look at the lineage of Jesus, there's her name. Her name is forever in the Bible. That's what God will do for you when you believe, when you accept him and come to him. You can cry about your past. You can cry about what was. Or you can shake that off and say, I'm a new creature in Christ. And because of Jesus, I've got a new future. My future is not based on men's statistics any longer. But my future is based on what God has declared. God, God says, listen, he says, I know the thoughts I think towards you. He says, they're good thoughts. You've got a good future ahead of you. Those are the thoughts that God has for you. Those are the thoughts that your father has for you. It's a future that's filled with Blessings from above. Opportunities that the world can never, ever give you. God has a future for you that's, that, is, that, is, that supplies rather supernatural provision. Look at the children of Israel in the desert. They went from being slaves to now God gave them supernatural provision. Manna and quail. They didn't, have to, they didn't have to kill the quail. They just dropped in front of them. They didn't have to plant anything for manna to be raised up. It, it appeared every morning. Supernatural provision. If he did it for them, won't he do it for you? Look at Jesus feeding 5,000 and 4,000. Supernatural provision. How about Elijah when he took off and ran because he was scared of Jezebel? And yet God had the birds, the crows that come along and drop meat in, in, in front of him on a daily basis. God knows how to provide. Your father knows how to provide for your every need. Healing for your body, that's what he provides. And the list goes on and on and on. We can we stand here all day talking about what God gives us as his children. 
So whatever past I had, that chapter is closed. That person no longer exists because I'm a new creature. Old things are past and all things become new. And that's why every, every society has created, created some form of marriage that requires a couple to pledge their fidelity to each other and normally it's for life. And this has been going on since the very beginning. There's not one civilization, not one, does not, does not have some form of that type of marriage, pledge fidelity and lifetime commitment. As I say, we live in a society that has redefined marriage. Uh, the state has redefined marriage. It's no longer defined as a permanent relationship or even be being between a man and a woman. In fact, it's not even defined as being, just, uh, being defined as just between two people. Really, why not five people get married? 10, 20. One man, 20 people just get married and they all married. Uh, that's, 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 that's where it's at. Let me show you something else. Even though it's found in the Bible multitudes of times, God does not sanction polygamy. That's never, that has never been God's idea of marriage. It's polygamy. Y'all know what polygamy is. Normally we see it among the, uh, it used to be the Mormons. Uh, I guess some of them still do it. Uh, one man has multiple wives. In fact, they even have a, a TV show about it, Sister Wives. And they talk about the, how great it is because the women can, ha you know, they, 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 they're, they're together. You know, and we find out through our, our, our scripture, you know, Husbands, men have had multiple wives. Uh, uh, what's his name? King Solomon had 700 wives and 1,000 concubines. I mean, this is, this is just crazy. David had multiple wives, and all throughout the kings had multiple wives, and even regular had multiple wives. But that was not God's idea, and that was never God's best. That was what men came up with. That was the culture of its day. But here's the problem with polygamy. It treats women like cattle. It sanctions and perpetuates gender inequality. See, God never said that, listen, God never said in Genesis that Eve was second to Adam. Never says that. It says she was his helpmate. She was, they were working together. In other words, he was, it's not good for him to be alone. God made him a companion to help him do what God had called him to do. So they would do this together. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Now, I know down through the ages, people have read all kind of crazy stuff into it, but their, 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 their reading is wrong. Helpmate does not mean secondary. It's like, you know, it's like we always try and rank stuff. We look at the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. We want to rank them. Well, God, you know, the Father is number one, the Son is number two, and the Holy Ghost is number three. No, the Bible doesn't say that. They're Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They are God. There isn't a ranking. Well, the Bible says Jesus sits on the right hand of majesty. You're right. He sits on the right hand of majesty. Where's the right, what's the right hand? The right hand is the hand of power. The Bible calls Jesus the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. It doesn't say he was, he was secondary. It says he is the Word. The Word was with God. They were there together. And he's the Word that was spoken that created everything that exists. And everything is held upright and together by his power because he's the Word. The Bible nowhere ranks Jesus second. And it definitely doesn't rank the Holy Ghost third. There's no ranking in the Godhead. They are God. There's no ranking in marriage because marriage is a reflection of God. So there's no ranking in marriage. It's not the, now, wait, 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 Pastor, wait a minute, Pastor. The man is the head of the house. Yes. That doesn't mean his wife is not equal with him. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Does not mean his wife is not equal with him. Because, see, listen, if this were the case, 
of you know, ranks than when, uh, when a, 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 a man got saved in his household, then his whole household would be saved automatically. But it doesn't work that way, does it? Because he gets saved and his wife is still not saved and they die. Guess who's going to heaven and guess who's going to hell? And she could say all day long, yeah, but my husband was saved. Don't that count? Counts for him. Don't count for you. Because it's not about ranking. It's about we're still individuals. But we are together in marriage, walking together to, com to accomplish a common goal and to fulfill the image of Christ before a lost and dying world. All right, so, so what polygamy does is, and the Bible says when a man, it, they become one flesh. So now this guy who has five wives, he's one flesh with all of them. That means six people now are one flesh? No. Here again, it doesn't work that way. Because God made Adam, and then he made Eve, and he took the rib out of Adam and made Eve, and then that was a separation. And when we get married, we become one flesh, we join back together again. The marital norms of monogamy are sexual, sexual uh, exclusivity. And it's permanency, and that's what makes a difference in society, and that's what makes a civilization flourish. Marriage increases the odds that a man will be committed to the woman and to the children that he helps create. Marriage brings that to fruition. Marriage brings together the two halves of humanity, male and female. Women, woman, excuse me, woman was taken out of man to be his companion, and marriage joins them back together. And through their sexual act, they become one flesh. That's why a marriage isn't a marriage until it's consummated. Now, lack of marriage creates not only fatherless children, not only fragmented families, begin to increase, but also societal decline. So when we talk about marriage in society, marriage is necessary for culture, it's necessary for a society, it's necessary to promote civilization. It is necessary, it's the foundation stone to determine whether culture or society or civilization will flourish or whether it's gonna unravel, ultimately decline and fall out and become nothing. That's why the battle for marriage is so important. It's not just for the church, it's for the civilization, the society around us. It's so that for our children and children's children, there'll be a country that will flourish and be mighty because we've stood with the principle of marriage. And that principle deals with economics, that principle deals with abortion. That principle deals with uh, uh, all manner of things. All manner of things. Once you have that principle and work that principle correctly, then there's so many other things that will flourish and, do, and be right. But it starts with marriage. Amen? Amen. We'll continue this next week. We pray that it's been a blessing to you. For those who are watching by streaming live, we pray that it's been a blessing to you and we pray it helped you, give you a greater understanding of marriage, the principle of marriage and how it affects the culture that we live in. How it affects the culture we live in. If you want to see a better country, then the thing we have to fix above any and everything else is marriage. That's the thing we have to fix. Because when there's a marriage, and it's the right kind, it's a God type of marriage, then we don't have to worry about alcoholism or drug abuse. I'm not saying folks won't still drink or people won't abuse drugs, but it won't be, it won't be rampant. We won't see it destroy, literally destroy families and, and so forth. Because we're operating in a godly principle that works. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Come back next week for more of Marriage and Family. We are grateful you chose to join us today for Pastor Dave's teaching. If you have questions during the week or are in need of prayer, please email us at office 
at kingdomfirstfw.com and be sure to join us for our next broadcast. During this time, please remember to be safe, be well, and be blessed.